All right, well, here we are again for InfoSec Decoded number seven, bit squatting. And we're starting with Alan, who's got Facebook with their latest excuse to Congress. Yes, the markup has an article entitled, Facebook says technical issues were the cause of broken promise to Congress. Back in October, Facebook promised to Congress that they would stop recommending political groups to Facebook users. The idea being that Facebook's recommendations, political group recommendations in the past, often led to people getting caught up in radical political groups and movements online. Well, this organization, The Markup, uh, distributed a uh, application to 1,000 paid users, participants, and this application monitored these users' uh, Facebook feeds and activity and found that, in fact, Facebook was continuing to recommend groups, political groups, to users well into January. And so in the wake of this, uh, Senator Ed Markey of, is it Delaware, um, sent a letter to Facebook saying, hey, turns out you guys weren't telling the truth and users are still being recommended uh, political groups. What's going on? And then wouldn't you know it, amazingly, suddenly all these recommendations just stopped. So it appears that Facebook can indeed turn off the political group recommendations to users, but sometimes has some difficulty doing this. They attribute it to technical issues, but they were able to execute on it within just days of Senator Markey's letter. So it really does beg the question whether Facebook is sincerely interested in uh, better controlling uh, disinformation on its platform, or if they're just paying lip service to the party that happens to be in control right now. I'm surprised they didn't blame an intern. You know, yeah, they missed out on an op opportunity right there. I don't think there's any question about that question you raised. I don't think there's any <laughs> question for 10 years. I mean, and Facebook just announced they're going to let political ads back on. So, oh, did they really? Yeah. Oh, so. Well, it, it seems like political discourse is a big driver of engagement on Facebook. Well, so, especially in America, boy, everybody, yeah. is, there's nothing more they want to read than something rotten about the other side. Right, <laughs> right. It, it must be just tremendous for engagement. It must get people all riled up and, and glued to Facebook. So uh, yeah. apparently there's a very strong business interest in keeping this political discourse happening. If you can even call it discourse on yeah. Facebook. Hey. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Well, so I, that's, uh, I, there's more and more talk about actually regulating Facebook or hitting them with antitrust or something because they've just been a bad actor over and over and over again with empty promises. Yeah, they can't get anything right, it seems. Or they, well, they're they can't right, tell they're the making money, but they just, they never obey the rules. Right. And all their promises make no sense. It's been right from the start. They're originally never supposed to leave college campuses. They just break everybody's promise over and over again. Anyway, I've got the politics article. That's what liked me, how interested me this week. The Trump strategy for returning to power is already clear here in the New Yorker, which I think is very good. And it points out how many other nations have done exactly what, I, what Trump has done. And I, of course, often think of Hitler in the 1930s that did exactly the same thing, but the many current examples, Viktor Orban was the prime minister of Hungary and he lost an election. So he started saying it was a fraudulent election and it was all rigged. And then he got back in and then he never left. He took over the country, became an oligarch, just like Putin. The same thing happened in Poland. It's happened in a bunch of countries, exactly the same. And we're watching it all happen here. You know, some of us thought that Trump would just give up and go away after he lost the election, but he's following the playbook of the people he told us all along. He thought were wonderful, like Putin, and wanted to imitate them. This is how you do it. If you lose an election, you just deny it and lie about it and lead your followers in to take over. And then uh, they're in the process of reforming American voting laws right now to make it so Republicans can stay in and other people can't vote. And um, if the Democrats continue to be too cowardly to end the filibuster, then they will just be paralyzed just like um, Obama was. And Republicans will rig the game and take over and never leave. 
This is happening and Trump will just be a dictator for life, which is what he wants. That's what he said he wanted all along. And there are many examples all over the world of it working. So uh, as far as I can tell, we have not really stopped Trump at all. He's right on a straight line down the established path to become the dictator. Um, and uh, this is how it works. You lose and you lie about it and you keep your supporters. And as far I think it's something like 75% of Republicans believe that Trump won the last election. And that's how you do it. So we're still in big trouble here. And uh, I, recall, I think I recall a clip from last weekend's CPAC thing where he mm -hmm. said, we're going to win the White House a third time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and there were people at all the Trump marches carrying signs just saying Trump, Trump, Trump. And Trump put up this too. He wants to just stay in for term after term, ignore the term limits. And uh, since he's, the election's on, and he said right from the start, even before 2016 and 2015, they said, are you going to honor the election? He said, well, if I win, but if I don't win, then I'll call it a fake election. That's why the fun thing about Trump is it's all just out loud. There's no sneaky, subtle, underhanded trick. He just tells you, yeah, I'm going to go in there. And if I lose an election, that makes it a fake election. And if I win, then it's a good election. And I'm going to be just like Putin. Putin's a great guy. Kim Jong-un is a great guy. Those are the people I want to be. And his supporters love it. And I, I, and I, I used to I probably five years ago, I would have said, well, America is different than Poland and Hungary. We'd never do that, but I don't feel that way anymore. I don't think we are any different. And I think we're falling down the same path that they fell down. And uh, I think the Democrats need to get serious about stopping it. This is probably our only chance to stop it. Anyway. Yay. Um, then here's, here's the, I like this one. The silver lining of cyber attacks is more cybersecurity careers. I think that's how I got in this business. I think that's how we all got in this business. I remember Kevin Mandia at RSA saying, nobody else here is going to say it. I'll say it. The greatest thing to hit cybersecurity is LulzSec. They're the greatest thing that could have happened for us. <laughs> yeah. And that's uh, just, that's the gist of this article. Exactly. Uh, that there been, there's just been an explosion in cyber attacks since the beginning of COVID. Um, and so the, the upside of this is that uh, there are a lot more jobs in the industry. So it's great for us, great for our students, and uh, we really should be taking advantage of this. Now, um, you know, there's a theme to all three of my articles today, which is uh, there is this explosion in the job market. At the same time, Sam and I and Alan and I teach at a school where uh, they are in a state with record high numbers of unemployment with probably the best um, cybersecurity community college education program in the country, which is now being gutted. So uh, there is this massive demand. There's going to be uh, an even greater influx of students in it trying to pack into classes that won't be there. So now is probably not the best time to be cutting the legs out from underneath vocational training to get into a explosive growth market. So. No, it's, of course it isn't. But it is a good time to be getting into cybersecurity. Yeah. And you don't really need college to do it. That's one of many ways, but most people in cybersecurity really don't care much about degrees or anything. What they just care is, can you do it? Yep. You know, as much as I rag on Vladimir Putin, mm -hmm. uh, I think we have to agree that Putin's been great for cybersecurity, <laughs> for cybersecurity jobs. And if Russia had a more, let's say, uh, norm conforming, uh, law abiding cybersecurity policy, then we wouldn't have as many cybersecurity attacks. Meaning well, I think I think China and North Korea do a lot of them too. Yeah, I was, was going to say a no. The, a lot of the financially motivated hacking is originating in Russia. Well, yeah. So, um, and I'm not talking about APT stuff. I'm just talking about run-of-the-mill financially motivated hacking. And uh, so, if if uh, the Russian government were to crack down on that, I think that would mean there would be less hacking out there. Which, oh yes, but that would be a huge cultural shift in Russia. Yeah, I was going to say, you know who we should be thanking? Kim Jong-un. 
<laughs> well, for the North Korean stuff, but they mostly do like cryptocurrency hacks. That's true. And and for people at home, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. He's, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, I mean, they do plenty of hacking, but I don't think it's the type that affects an average American directly. No. Mm. And then we got, um, Urban's got Brave. Brave. Brave apparently has acquired a search engine. Is there any search engine other than Google and Bing? To my knowledge, no, unless there's something offshore, but apparently they got, they got one. Tail wait, cat. Wait, what, yeah. what about... Duck, duck, go. Duck, duck, go. Yeah, duck, duck, go. But what is now they got? Tail. Yeah, but duck, duck, go relies on Bing. Does it? It does. Wow, oh. I never knew that. Yeah. I never knew that either. Yeah, duck, duck, go just pat just takes out any of the identifying stuff and then sends the request to Bing. And by the way, I think Brave's browser is just a sh shell for Chrome. It is just a shell for Chrome, just like Opera, just like uh, Chromium, just like a bunch of others. So there's something called Tailcat, the open search engine. I never heard of Tailcat. How could they possibly compete with Google? And that's, and you know what? There was an article I read not that long ago that it had that exact question. Yeah. How do you compete against Google? They, they invest so much time and money to index the world and yeah. every page in existence. How do you compete against that without spending a bajillion dollars to build yeah. up a, an infrastructure just like it to crawl the web? I mean, I could, if Amazon wanted to fund it, then maybe I could buy it. But I don't think Brave has got the muscle to punch against Google. Me either. Uh, this is a nice attempt, but I don't think it's gonna go anywhere. Well, this is like why Elizabeth Warren says we need to break up these tech monopolies. I mean, several of them have grown so big that you just might as well give up. Like, how are you gonna compete in social against Facebook? Right, right. Yeah, well, yeah, let's see what they do. Cause yeah, I don't have high hopes for this. No. On the other hand, I have noticed that Google search results quality has gone down over the last 10 years. So I think there might be a vulnerability there, but you'd have to be a pretty serious company to try it. They'd be heavily funded. Yep. And then Caitlin's got once a quadruple internet speeds. Well, that sounds good. Yes. yes. Um, so on the same vein of bad things having in the end sort of good results, um, this pandemic has sort of has awakened uh, a lot of lawmakers' eyes to the fact that the internet is an essential utility, which is something a few years ago would have been preposterous to you know, put forward. Um, and so, uh, because it's now obvious that people really need the internet, you know, just to do their daily tasks, do their work, et cetera, the base speed defining high-speed internet um, is going up from 25 megabits down uh, and three megabits up to 100 megabits down and 100 megabits per second up. Uh, so that's, a, that's about four times faster down and uh, a lot, <laughs> uh, about a little over 30, 30 times uh, higher up. Um, yeah. So that's good. That's good. I like seeing these changes from the FCC. Um, I like seeing pressure being put on ISPs to, to speed up people's internet because it's very easy when you have ISPs that are these big conglomerates that control the industry that where they don't have much competition or, or incentive to improve, you know, to have something like the FCC saying, hey, no, this is what high speed is. And this is what you should be shooting for. And if your, your customers are not getting 100 megabits down and 100 megabits up, you know, then. No, yeah. 100 down and 12 up. Oh, I thought, no, uh, you know, it's a 100 megabits down, 100 megabits up is the new base for high speed. Broadcast. Really? Wow. Yes. Why, why up? Normal people don't need up. They don't, uh, but also keep in mind that- um, Unless they well, want us all to run Bitcoin. Well, well yeah. If you've, got, if, you've got a, if you've got five kids and two parents on Zoom, I can see how your upload speeds might begin to matter. Yeah, no, I was, I was gonna say, keep in mind, these, these numbers are highly uh, uh, reflective of the needs during the pandemic. Right, so everyone's zooming, everyone's sending out, you know, voice and video chat communications and sharing their desktops. Well, I got Comcast and it's 180 down and eight up, and it's yeah. working pretty well. It, I don't it need is 100 up. Who would need 100 up? I do. <laughs> well, yeah, but what what are you doing with that? Are you running your server at home? Yes. Yes. Well, but that's <laughs> of course what they don't want you doing. Yeah. I, well. I mean, yeah. Keep keep in mind keep in mind that a lot of the the so some of the some of the non 
the, the slower upload speeds are, are partially due to older technology not being able to support support that and prioritizing and prioritizing download speeds. Yeah. But a lot of that is just arbitrary too, right? Yeah. Like they could allow you to get you know 100 up, 100 down, but they don't want to because they you don't want to make it you for a more. business account if you want yeah. the upload speed that's how it works right. yeah well yeah. and they the, you know but these arbitrary caps they found out like for example like they had data caps and they removed them for a brief period of time during the pandemic it didn't affect anything um in terms of quality or, or um availability of service but they've reinstated them because they can they just, just because they can. And, um, you know, it's, it's, there's no alternative where I am. That's the only thing you can get. It's terrible speeds, uh, for extortionate amounts of money. They force you into a two-year contract if you want to use it at all, where if you cancel or switch providers, you're liable to pay the entirety of that two-year contract. I mean, it's just insane. Mm. Plus they've had, They've been given money, uh, both them and AT&T have been given public money by the government to build out the infrastructure. There have been promises made. There's no infrastructure to show for it, and we don't know where that money went because it was there's no accountability. So now we have no the money's gone, and there's no infrastructure. Yeah, it sounds all too typical, but Elon Musk is going to save you. Well, we'll talk about that maybe. He, that might be. Well, we'll talk about that later in the podcast. Okay. Uh, but but the, I, the other thing too that, that might be uh, driving the 100 megabits per second up is just the FCC wanting to expand capabilities of people's internet at home. Yeah. You know, just trying to force innovation. Like if people suddenly all have good upload speeds, maybe new technologies can come from that. And, and then there's the digital divide. I mean, my, my grading assistant and a, 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 like 15% of my students have nothing at all. And I'm trying to set them up with like two megabit per second hotspots, which would be the giant leap forward for them. Right. And I mean, that's, it's a huge problem. Uh, infrastructure, um, internet infrastructure is a big problem in the United States, uh, partially because, you know, we didn't de decline, declare it as a, as a utility, as a necessary utility before, and partially because of the fact that it's controlled by a very few number, a very few uh, number of um large businesses, large companies that basically control the entire market, don't allow new people in and don't have competition. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's as if unregulated monopolies don't really work that well. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't get it either. It's... Yeah, yeah, all right. And all right, so I think that's it for the first batch. Let's go to Alan with the Russian cyber conflicts. Yes, it's another Brian Krebs special. It would have to be, yeah. <laughs> yes, who else? Uh, he's got an article uh, called Three Top Russian Cyber Crime Forums Hacked. Turns out in the past couple of months, three major longtime and uh, highly regarded, very reputable uh, Russian language hacking forums, Maza, Verified, and Exploit, have all been hacked more or less at the same time. Mm. And their uh, logs and user lists have been dumped with all kinds of information, uh, user names, user email addresses, user ICQ identities, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. And um, these attacks were very different from one another and fairly complex. Uh, it seems that in one case, there was a proxy server that was being used to defend the forum from uh, one of these forums from DDoS attacks that got hacked. And so the attacker was, uh, essentially man in the middling all the traffic. Uh, in another case, the uh, forum had a Bitcoin wallet and that, that got hacked and uh, stolen, dumped. Um, and uh, so there's been speculation that uh, since obviously these attacks were fairly sophisticated because these forums have been around for a long time, presumably have decent security that the attacker was in fact a nation state and that this nation state is interested in uh, doing a little research into what's going on inside of this. And then forums. dumping it publicly? Why would a nation state do that? Well, to embarrass them. Yeah. I, mean, I would just, when I heard this, I just assumed it must be a rival cybercrime gang. Well, 
but there were three of these forums all attacked at more or less the same time. Yeah. So it would, and, and there's no, as, as far as I understand, there's no clear beneficiary in this uh, hacking space. But when you dump it publicly, you hurt a bunch of innocent victims. Usually no government agency is willing to do something that irresponsible. Well, there are no innocent victims here. They're, they're dumping the users, these forum users. And keep in mind that these are in invite only forums too. Not oh, just okay. anybody can register on them. So- But for example, I don't think the US- Forums, would do they have ill intent to begin with. Yeah, just, I. well, that part surprises me. Also the part where they hacked a proxy server surprises me. Now, if you hacked a proxy server like Cloudflare, you still shouldn't see anything personal. Well, this was operated by the forum. Something oh, they made their different. own proxy and their proxy, their proxy server. Uh, yep. Yep. Yeah. Well, that makes sense because they probably couldn't get any commercial business to uh, cross right. with their criminal activities. Right. It would make sense that these bulletproof places are vulnerable because they can't use normal uh, services. Yes. And yeah. Evidently, they're not as well defended as, uh, say, the cloud flares of the world. Well, sure. And also not as careful in how they handle the data. But that yes. makes sense. Um, I guess this would be one thing you could do as a sort of uh, vigilante law enforcement thing to just punish them. Yeah, to punish them uh, and also to sow uh, discontent, discord, and paranoia. Yeah, yeah, just to sort of disrupt the underground. Right. It sounds more like something anonymous would do than something a nation state would do, but anyway. Yeah, as far as I know, nobody's taking credit for this publicly, mm -hmm. though, because uh, that would be suicide. I would think so, yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, uh, all right, I've got this Celeste Headley, a podcast, which is, I think, one of the Sway podcasts, and this is really fantastic. This She talks about how to have better conversations with people, and it's very interesting. And uh, one of the things she said, which I thought helped me understand a lot, she said, humans are not rational actors. They are social and emotional thinkers, and you better just understand that and stop trying to pretend they're rational. So if you're arguing with somebody, for example, across our big political divide, the main issue, and you try quoting statistics from a New York Times article, you're not going to get anywhere. That never convinces anybody. You got to talk about real experiences and how you feel and what you think would make the world better and say, you know, we got these homeless people dying in the street and how do we fix that? And then you can maybe get somewhere. And the, the thing that I find that most of the liberals I know do not get is the reason people are conservative is not because they have thought it through and logically concluded that they should follow Donald Trump's policies, of which there are no policies. They're on a team. And this is what 99% of human conversation is, and also chickens. It's what team are you on? I, I was at a faculty meeting. I just listened to it. I didn't have anything to, to say. I didn't have to. I listened to it. It's all about what team are you on? That's what 99% of conversation is. Are you on my side or are you on the other side? How much are you on my side? Where's my status? That's what it's really all about. And, you know, you, you connect with people. This is what um, I heard Trevor Noah say this about Trump when Trump was a candidate in 2015. He said, people say he can't win. And he said, I don't know. I've heard African dictators that talk like this. And the thing you're missing is he connects with the audience. They feel like he is one of them, like he represents them, like he's on their team. They have an emotional connection to him, and that's why they're supporting him. It's not logic or anything. And there's no point yelling at people and telling them to become logical actors. It's not going to get there. You just have to meet them where they're at. They are social and emotional actors. Anyway, I think uh, I thought it was very interesting, useful in the form of social engineering and communications, which is what I push a lot in my classes, you know, make students give talks. Uh, learning to communicate with humans is like really important. It is. You're absolutely correct. Um, if, if you want to manipulate someone, play on their emotions. Do not try to get them to, uh, uh, don't try to sway them with facts. You know, like the, one of the first things you learn when you're social engineering is make something urgent, right? Yeah. You make it seem like something's really important, about to happen. You need this done right away. So you get people in a panic and then they're yours. You don't, you don't say, well, logically, you should be giving me access to the account because you know this is the correct method as, as you know, and we can debate this if you want. No, what you do is you say, no, I need this access right now or else you know everything is gonna crumble and the, the boss is gonna get all mad, please, please. And you, and you play on their empathy and their sympathy. And I mean, 
Yeah. And therefore, I think on the defensive side, you should watch for that. Is this person trying to create an emotional storm and an emergency, in which case I'll say, well, you know, we're not going to do anything impulsive here. Let's, uh, I got to talk to my supervisor and call you back or something. That's, oh, that's a good idea. Maybe having a, a, a policy at the, at the work about, you know, no emergency, stressful things going on. Yeah, and that way, if something does come up in an email, like, oh, we need this done right away, you know that something's up. Yep. I think so. That's why banks, I remember I was always the, the financial arm of companies that issues money is never in a hurry, never working until midnight, never stressed. You have to wait till tomorrow. Uh, they never want to hear it. If you say you have to do something right away, they say, no, we just don't do that at all. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so, and then Liz has got uh, California's quest to prioritize older students. Yes. Boy, so, we have uh, that. Our college just totally abandoned them about five years well, ago. Yeah, exactly. This is uh, just further proof that uh, our college administrators don't read their own trade publications because this is from a publication called University Business that is for administrators and management to understand what the current trends in education are so they make fewer stupid decisions. But our administrators don't care about that. Uh, they seem to be out on a quest and a mission to make as many terrible decisions as possible because, hey, it's all public money. Who cares? It's all free. There's no uh, accounting or oversight. And well, now, how, that's totally unfair. There's no <laughs> money. That's the problem. There's no money, but go ahead. Oh, there's plenty of money. It's just getting wasted and frittered away and embezzled uh, at every well, possible yeah. opportunity. But uh you know the the numbers the numbers uh are different from people who come out and are literally paid and, and make it their life's work to study these things like job market and education and and so forth um we have realized and it, it seems like you shouldn't need a study to understand this with and when you're in a state with record high levels of unemployment that uh um you know, our, one of our biggest areas of opportunity here is uh, people in the ages 25 to 54 age well, range. That's what I noticed. Since when is 25 to 54 old? Well, uh, in terms of in, in terms of college students, when we're looking at you know when we you know the old model, the old model was you know typically you've got your 18 to to 22 range for, for college students, but that model is long outdated, especially here. We know that our, I, I would say the vast, uh, the vast majority of my students are in that uh, 25 to 54 range and a lot of them at the higher end of that because a lot of folks are uh, retraining for new careers or looking to build more skills in the career they're in so they can move up. And, uh, you know, this, this is, because our college has decided that uh, they're going to commit to a real narrow model, they're completely ignoring this massive market of students, uh, which is just getting even bigger right now with the pandemic. So um, this is this should be an area of focus uh, for us as educators, a major area of focus, especially in the state right now. Uh, but yet again, um, at least at our institution, and I believe at others, um, the legs are being cut out from the programs that that serve these students. So, um, you know, well, <laughs> we're in we're in a, right now in San Francisco. We've got record high numbers of unemployment. Uh, crime is exploding. Um, and what could go wrong with uh, removing the the free uh, vocational training that we have in the city right now? Yeah, I've heard I a lot about any that. issues there. Yeah. I'm, I mean, and also my own mother, who is, believe it or not, older than I am, you know, is, is a college student. Um, yeah. I mean, there's, there are people of, of all ages that go to college, not just for, not just to get jobs, not just to do anything. I mean, she, she's retired. She just wants to learn. And the thing is, is that if you are retired and you are going to college, you actually act as a resource for that college as well. Like you're not just there just to, you know, soak up as much as possible. You have bills already that you yep. can pay others. <laughs> yeah. yes. That used to be one of the prime missions of City College was lifelong learning. And we had a whole bunch of retirees that would just go to college and take like horticulture or whatever. 
And uh, then they cut them off. And I never really understood why, because that seemed to me like a very good idea. Yeah, especially considering you think about it from a business perspective, most of those people are paying customers. They're, they're not coming in on, um, you know, needing financial aid from the institution. They're, they're paying. They, like Caitlin said, come in with a wealth of life experience and knowledge and skills that they contribute to the institution. Um, and I think for, in our case, for a lot of those seniors, that was their primary form of social interaction. It's a really important community resource. Um, you know, in our, in our, another kind of tragedy of our, our current cuts is that they are not just cutting the legs out from our program, um, vocational training, but also um, disabled student services. They've cut that by 40%. They've um, gutted the uh, English as a second language program for students who um, want to come in and uh, uh, they're, they're not native English speakers, so they want to learn how to speak English. I mean, that's completely insane because, um, you know, a lot of those students, too, are um, not your typical 18 to 22 college student. Um, a lot of them are in the workforce right now and, um, you know, want to want to improve their English language skills. and. And those students who are your typical college students and need those services um, are going to have a real uphill battle getting into other classes and getting through their education without that fundamental ESL training, without those um, disability services. Uh, and it's, it's just a real shame to see what's happening. I don't think that a lot of, I don't think even a lot of our students are aware of what's going on right now, let alone the general public. Um, otherwise, I think there might be more of um, an outcry about this because it's a terrible time to lose these, um, to lose this asset for the community. And I think it's going to have really long, terrible long term uh, ramifications for the city. Oh, I think it does. Yeah. And I, yeah. It's a poor economic choice to make, that's for sure, because um, it's obvious when we educate these students, I mean, I've seen it time and again, uh, we educate these students, they come through our classes, and then they get fantastic jobs. I mean, what better way to increase your tax base in such a short period of time when you take someone who's coming in, they're making $30,000 a year, trying to support their family on that, they come out of the program, uh, they're making 80 grand a year. I mean, it's a no brainer to me. Yeah, there's nothing has a higher return on investment than providing people free education and free health care. Obviously, both of those things will return $10 for every dollar you spend on it. Yeah. And then Urban's got bit squatting, which is a great word. I'm mean, using it for a title. <laughs> <clears throat> Yes, uh, bit squatting. Apparently, well, I guess not surprising. Uh, it's a uh, still. It's very easy to uh, to get users to misspell domains, and users are continually doing that even today. It happens a lot, so it's easy to uh, to traffic those domains and trick users. Still, uh, all of automated services also can create a lot of bit squatted traffic. Uh, so there's an example of the Windows stop code that happens when, when you get the blue screen of death, uh, that it's easy to change that and get it to go somewhere, uh, get the user to go somewhere they shouldn't. So if they scan the QR code, they could go somewhere else. There's a QR code on the blue screen of death now? Yeah. <laughs> I guess I haven't used Windows in a while. That's new. Me either. I didn't know until I saw that picture that they had the uh, there is a QR code now. Oh. Now, he, now he's suggesting here that it's not human typos, it's bits being lost in the computer. I wonder how often that happens. That sounds pretty rare to me. Apparently it does happen enough that there are sites now that, that take that traffic. Hmm. Yep, so he bought a bunch of domains and he gets a bunch of traffic. Did he get anything really exciting? Um, it doesn't look like he got anything exciting, but the proof of, you know, if somebody was doing this maliciously, they really could. Yeah, I've seen uh, talks with typo squatting where you carefully get ones like Google with a third O and stuff, and then you get a whole bunch of corporate emails and stuff. Mm -hmm. I think that happened to City College. The head of the Board of Trustees had his email address typed wrong, and he never got any of the official email for like two years before anybody noticed. Oh, fun. 
Well, I mean, they, they, they mislabeled my mailbox at City College and I got zero internal mail for a whole semester and it was perfectly fine. I mean, it's all garbage. None of it matters. True. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. I noticed they're not. I noticed they're not forwarding anything to us through from the pandemic. That's right. And we just had a department chair election, and they were like two months late counting the ballots. And it seemed like they got it wrong because they couldn't deliver the ballots. They don't know where they are. They really didn't find them all. I wonder how jam packed the mail rooms are. Yeah, I wonder too. They called me because there was a letter in there. And they and they sat there for like a month, and then they called me and said, "Hey, we got this letter, and we can't deliver it." And I'm like, "Dude, that's my ballot. Where are you sending those?" I said, "Oh, well, nobody told us what to do with them. We've got this stuff just piled all over the place." <laughs> Fun. Yeah. Well, you know, oh, to be fair, they never had much of a system, and then the pandemic hit, and nobody really knows anything. They don't know: Are people coming in the office? What do we do? Do we send it to their home? Mm -hmm. Is somebody in charge? What do we do? And nobody really has any clarity anywhere. And anyway, uh, so Caitlin's got a Japanese billionaire. Yep, it's just another day in the strange world of Japanese billionaire eccentric people. Bill, <laughs> uh, so there's this guy um, named uh, Yusaku uh, Baezawa who wants to um, go to the moon. Not land on the moon. So essentially the way this works is that uh, you can do a translunar injection in such a way that you sort of hit ahead of the moon, go around the moon, and then you get a free return back to earth. And that looks like what, what he's trying to do here. Um, and this is, as far as I can tell, just a pleasure cruise <laughs> to the moon, which um, it does not, I mean, yeah, I, I, th I know everyone wants to go to space and everything, but, um, yeah, this is going to be a tight quarters with uh, apparently like 10 other people <laughs> um, for over a week where you're bombarded by high levels of radiation and, you know, it's you're in a tin can going around the moon. It's it's this is going to be fun, I'm sure. But um, but he's looking for people to come with him to the moon for a pleasure trip. Um, and he's doing it on social media. So he's, he's, he went out to social media and say, hey, if you're interested in going to the moon with me, let me know, we'll go to the moon. <laughs> and uh, apparently, of course, there's a lot of people interested because that would be a trip of a lifetime. Um, just know what you're getting into uh, if you sign up. And uh, yeah, so yeah, this guy's super eccentric. Uh, instead of just looking for like an engineer, someone who can like patch the ship if something goes wrong, he's looking for artists. <laughs> and poets <laughs> to go with him um and initially like he just wanted a woman to like come with him to the moon <laughs> like it's just, is uh, he like, um uh, is he giving them the ride for free yes if you qualify you can go to the moon for free so it's just a stunt it's it's a stunt i mean you go with it's a it's a yes yeah, it's, it's ridiculous well, I don't it's, a know. Lot, it's not as ridiculous as elon musk that wanted people to go to mars where they will just die that well, that's, hard. yeah, that's true. Yeah, the, the going to Mars to die is <laughs> ridiculous. It, I don't know what it is with these billionaires and just like space. It, it, it's, I, I would, uh, I assume it's something very Freudian with the rockets or something. I don't know, but. I think they're like all of us. They watch Star Trek. I was a kid. I watched Star Trek. I said, I want to do that. That would be great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree. But I mean, there's plenty of things that we can do, you know, it's, yeah, this is, yeah, as far as, it's it's like going on a pleasure cruise in a submarine, like. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, there's that, sure. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it would be interesting. I would, I would say, you know, if you really want to go to space, uh, low Earth orbit is probably the best bet for you. You get these great views of Earth. Um, you know, going all the way to the far side of the moon and back is going to be like a two-week trip. Um, and it's, yeah, it's going to get difficult, but. Well, probably. yeah, but I might go. And I don't think I think I passed the test. Anyway, you might just reply to the tweet. Maybe you'll go to the moon. Well, yeah, I, I think I'm busy. Anyway, yeah. But all right, and then we got Alan with the FAA. Yikes! Yes, indeed, the U.S. Office of Inspector General has issued a report with the very snappy title of weaknesses in FAA certification and delegation processes hindered its oversight of the 737 MAX 8. That just rolls off the tongue so easily. It sure does. That's the one and that crashed twice and killed a whole bunch of people, right? Pages. It is some nice, easy reading. Um, 
This report is, of course, in response to the catastrophic crashes of two Boeing 737 MAXs, mm -hmm. and then the subsequent uh, realization that the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, possibly wasn't providing effective oversight of Boeing's certification process. Oh. And sure enough, in this uh, article or in this report, the OIG has identified that the FAA has a complicated relationship with Boeing and that in particular, the ODA, the Organization Designation Authorization, which allows manufacturers, aircraft manufacturers, to investigate themselves and to approve aircraft design changes themselves what? is just a little <laughs> problematic. Yes, this is how it works. This is how it works. That doesn't sound good. <laughs> well, you, you might say that and you might think that, but the reality is that for certain types of changes, it is totally cool if the aircraft manufacturer just does the testing and certification themselves and then tells the FAA, hey guys, looks good. The changes we're making are totally safe. We're going to roll with it. How and is that okay? That says, doesn't sound okay at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, let me just spoil this whole report for you then. It, it says that there are problems with the ODA. And so the FAA should make some changes to that process, but they can continue using the ODA. It's not a problem that this uh, self-certification exists in the first place. Well, I could hardly wait to get in another airplane. Yeah, the Boeing, the Boeing 737 Maxes, those are great aircraft from what I understand. They only crash occasionally. <laughs> well, and, yeah. and so they're not going to actually do anything to fix no. this problem, it sounds like. No, no, this, this report is pretty disappointing. They've got 14 recommendations, recommendations such as um, the FAA and Boeing should better coordinate with their information sharing and paperwork policy guidelines need to be followed more closely. But uh, unfortunately, in terms of substantive changes, uh, it particularly changes addressing possible conflicts of interest, such as uh, companies being asked to regulate themselves, those underlying issues are not being addressed. So what does this have to do with cybersecurity? Quite a lot. Aircraft crashes are very seldom because of a single point of failure. Usually there's an enormous chain of events and decisions and consequences of decisions that might have been made years or decades prior. Uh, aircrafts are very complex systems and their inception uh, architecting and uh, manufacturing is a complex process too. It's just like cybersecurity. Cybersecurity uh, incidents are rarely because of a single point of failure. Uh, instead, you have complex systems, computers, networks that are vulnerable for any number of reasons, complex and interrelated reasons. And so there's a lot to learn from aircraft crash investigations or reports such as this in cybersecurity because uh, simply that is the nature of complex systems and to yeah. understand any complex system, whether it's uh, an aircraft or a, a computer network, uh, can only be beneficial. Yeah, I remember this is how uh, my, my roommate described what we do in instant response. It's like when a plane crashes and then the NTSB comes in, uh oh, I hear like a shaver noise. I think that's coming from you, Alan, it usually is. Yeah, it uh, sounds like... Um... Interference. Yep, yep. Anyway, that's... Uh, it's Boeing getting on his case. That's right. Boeing must be hacking him for like putting them down. Yeah. They've, they've got aircraft buzzing my house right now. Yeah, that must be it. All right. And then, so anyway, here's the article bringing the public awareness to this issue of the city, cuts at City College, such as it is, some local newspaper called 48 Hills has written an article about it and uh it is crazy i mean they're cutting us like crazy people some departments are getting cut in half quite a few departments are canceled entirely our computer networking department is going from like 12 
teachers down to eight or six or something ridiculous like that. And uh, the way they're implementing it is madness. They sent layoff notices a couple days ago to full-timers that have been there for decades because, and really ruthless legal documents that said, you're, you're out of here and they don't mean it. Those, they're, what they really mean is you have to fire part-timers, but somehow the way you do that is by firing full-timers and then they're supposed to fire part-timers and steal their classes to get back in. So they don't tell the part-timers anything and they make them collateral damage and the full-timers are treated like dirt. So it's just an appalling system. And anyway, the end result is that all the students in our award-winning cybersecurity program are just not going to get service. Our classes are already full and they're canceling the full classes and firing the teachers that are teaching the full classes because the city college had a huge enrollment crisis and they got like a five-year temporary deal where they will continue to get funding regardless of enrollment. So they're using that time to cancel all the popular classes, fire the teachers that can teach them, so that in like two years, when we have to get enrollment back up, they won't be able to get enrollment back up. <laughs> so it is pretty appalling. And it looks really bad for it, the whole college, and especially for the cybersecurity program at the moment, unless we find some kind of dirty underhanded way to sneak some of our part-timers like Liz and, and Alan back in, we're gonna lose you guys. And then I might actually have to do some work or something ridiculous like that. And, and it'll really be bad for the program because now we got a nice program with like, a bunch of cybersecurity teachers and award-winning competition teams and all that good stuff. And we're not going to have all that when there's, when you people are gone. So it's nice that there's at least some newspapers covering it. Uh, it's, this can't really be to the benefit of the city to like choke off the college and not bother training people with vocational training they need in the current environment. I, I can't understand the rationale behind this decision. Um, the only excuse that I've heard so far is that the administrator making these cuts does, wants a smaller college to administer. I which, saw that. He says too much bother to like, to like administer all these classes. Just fire the teachers and have less classes so I don't have to work so much. Right. That's true civil service statement. <laughs> and I would think that that's just impossible there's no it's just too absurd to be true but oh no it is kind of on brand with uh what we've been seeing over the past couple of years because every time uh bailout money has been offered by the city um the the school has said well these are planned cuts we want to reduce the size of the college which i'm not really sure how that benefits the city or the state because that's going to just keep a lot more people poor, uh, in my, uh, uh, it seems like. Yeah, because this is something they found when they closed Compton City College. People said, well, maybe the students will just go to another college. And that is not what oh. happens. We are the last resort. When we close, they just don't go to college. We are. And we're, because of our security program, I mean, I've had students who were commuting um, to class from Sacramento before. They come from all over because... The other smaller colleges don't have a have a cybersecurity program like right. this, so, so they come from other counties, even commuting sometimes hours at a time just to come to this, so that they can go anywhere to get the education. So I think this is going to have uh, greater ramifications past just uh, past just San Francisco. And I mean, one thing that hasn't been brought up in any of these articles that I've seen is that we. Our, our program finally uh, achieved this um, National Security Agency uh, Center of Academic Excellence designation, which we are going to lose as a result of these cuts. Uh, there was a lot of effort put into that. It's a pretty prestigious designation. Um, we're we maybe the only community college in the state that has it, um, and it's going to be gone. I think there's a couple others that have it. Yes, yeah, Ohlone and Coastline are the two others. But okay. you do need to have a functional college. It can't be just one teacher. It has to be competing in teams and you have to have various others. You know, we, we certainly are not going to deserve it anymore after these cuts. Yeah. And you need, you really need more than one in the state. I mean, it's, yeah. you need more than five in the state because you've really got to, um, you know, one issue, yes, there is a plethora of jobs, but, uh, you know, some of the best jobs, students, and you don't necessarily need a college education to get a lot of these jobs, but some of them you do. 
um, especially a lot of the government um, contractor jobs and government positions. Um, you do need um, to have some level of education or have been through a program. Um, even just getting an associate's can open a lot of doors for folks. And, you know, another issue that I see is that a lot of our students are, uh, are veterans um, and they're in there um, trying to build a new career for themselves after um, having left a service and, and you know, that's, that's another area where veterans are already an underserved population in, in terms of so, in so many areas. And we're just going to also yank this opportunity out from underneath them. So it's, it's really kind of sad to see that this is the way that, that we're trending and that there's no oversight to um, stop any of the bleeding or to pull back and say, hey, like maybe we should make some smarter decisions about this stuff. And my CISSP class, I think, is mostly veterans. When I have them give talks, they talk about their military uh, history and stuff. They're very impressive people. Yeah. So. And yeah, this, I mean, it, it bears repeating that a good, uh, a high proportion of, of homeless are, uh, are veterans. Yeah. And I've had ones like that. I've had people who have been like in jail and homeless, and they take some of our colleges and uh, some of our classes, then they get a job and they get put back on a, a better track. I mean, in some ways, what we're doing is social work. Yes. Yeah. You know, having read that article, I was very disappointed because the narrative about these cuts, even in a publication like 48 Hills, that one would think is a slightly more sympathetic to City College, the narrative is that the college has a budget problem and the solution to the budget problem is to lay off workers. And there are too many classes being offered, so we need to reduce the number of classes. That is essentially what I read in that article. Mm -hmm. And that's a complete misrepresentation of the facts of the situation. And I'm afraid that there will not be any kind of meaningful public pushback to these cuts simply because there is no meaningful uh, narrative or understanding of the actual ground facts of the situation. Um, I don't know what can be done to change this either because uh, local news sources like TV stations, SF Gate, The Chronicle, they're not even interested in this story. They're not going to cover it. If they do cover it, they'll interview the chancellor, they'll interview some of the boards, uh, members of the board of trustees, they might interview one teacher they might interview one student and the conclusion will be, oh, there are too many classes at City College. They're spending too much money. They need to reduce their spending. The way to do that, cut classes. Well, I'm I think something that outsiders cannot understand is that the so-called administrators have absolutely no idea what's going on. I mean, the chancellor yeah. is just an endless series of temps wandering in who never even know what's happening at all. Uh, and... Uh, the board of trustees is just a bunch of people that want to run for city council and mayor. And they're just there as like a temporary attempt to get some TV time. So the people that are ostensibly in charge have in fact, zero clue what's happening. And I, I understand that outsiders won't understand that. Yeah. Right. I, I suppose it's maybe it's too much to ask for uh, outsiders to understand what's going on, but you know, it, it still confounds me that the administrators of the college still want to, uh, undercut the school and are very interested in seeing it fail essentially by yes. cutting it so much it's going to fail yes and Maybe that the unions are uh, conspiracy in theory might be right that there is pardon? some kind of pressure the union has been saying that there's some kind of outside force oh. killing the college that wants to like take the land or something yeah right 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 yeah yeah and it, so it just doesn't make any sense like these administrators they're making good money, $350,000 a year plus a $5,000 a month uh, housing allowance. And so you'd think they'd want to keep these jobs, you know, run the college well, make sure it's stable and just hold on to that job for 10 years. You're going to be very well compensated for it. And well, for instead, the last 10 years, we're not getting those people. What we're getting is the uh, carpetbaggers that yeah. their, their business model is to get a job for a year or two, then 
quit and sue, yeah. get fired and sue, and then move on to the next one. And right. Leave, a, leave a, a trail of destruction in their wake because there's no accountability. Um, they'll just go get a job in another district. And, you know, one thing I think, Alan, you make a very good point that uh, the, the narrative focuses around uh, the only way to save money is uh, by cutting classes, but that's total bull because uh, I, I read a pretty interesting study that came out 10 years, over 10 years ago, um, that uh, there was an analysis that was done, and this was, this has been updated since then. Um, so we, it's not new. We've known this as an issue, saying that we could save millions of dollars by consolidating administration. That's where the problem is, um, is, is in how our, our overgrown uh, administration and the duplication of administrative positions, like we're managing ourselves to death, um, essentially. Um, I, I thought it was pretty interesting. This was from a report in the San Francisco Chronicle uh, some time ago where uh, they analyzed 16 different community college districts um, and had uh, in those 16 districts, they had duplication in 21 of their um, executive uh, management positions. And that didn't include uh, chancellors or presidents. Um, and so they had uh, and this was this was 10 years ago. The salaries are much higher now. They had um, the total number of employees at that level as being 253, earning a cumulative salary of $30 million with benefits at $8 million, wow. uh, which is insane. Uh, and, and they said that the cost of employing just 15 executives plus their support staff could cost a district uh, $6 million, and that was in 2010. Uh, so it's much, it's much greater than that. They could have consolidated their, um, the, these districts could consolidate their leadership to they have one chancellor, one board, one, one head for each administrative office. Uh, and, uh, they could, they could, and, and the whole point of this report was that they could offer the classes that student need, that students need if they did that. But, um, the problem here again, it's sort of like the it's sort of like the air uh, airplane story we were talking about. They're they're the ones in charge of do their own oversight. So there's nobody going to come in and say, well, we need to redo. You know, we, hey folks, maybe this maybe these ten thousand dollar housing allowances on top of a three hundred thousand dollar salary are excessive. Maybe you shouldn't get a maybe you shouldn't get a a, a car funded by the taxpayers in addition to all of that. Uh, and, and maybe we need to pull back a little bit. Um, or maybe we need to consolidate our administrators because then they might have to do some actual work. Um, if we've got 10 of them, then 10 people in the same position, then nobody has to do anything except write a, writing a meeting, meaningless email full of platitudes once a month and uh, uh, have Zoom meetings occasionally. So. Um, you know, I think you're right in that that is a, the, the cutting classes, which is our only product, is a pretty disingenuous or a pretty disingenuous argument. Yeah, absolutely, couldn't 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 have said it better myself, Liz. I, you know, the the the, the thing that's so appalling about these administrators is that it seems like many of them are just not competent at their jobs. And these are people who would fail in the business world. Uh, so they, the reason why they come to education is because it's the only place where they can not only get a job, but keep a job and then move up in the ranks. It's like uh, education administration is the backstop for ambitious people with no skills. Well, yes. I, I think you're right. Of course, I, I wish to say, I don't feel too negative about this really because I never thought it was any different. And if you're, if you're a hacker, then what you look for is a broken system you can exploit. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, I think we may be able to save our little program through like sneaky dodges. And that's, that's my current plan. And that's all it's ever been all along. The only reason I was ever able to teach any of this security is because there was no management. There was nobody to say no. If there'd been any management, they would never let me teach any of these classes. So, 
the fact that it's completely broken and dysfunctional, I see more as a feature than a bug, really. But anyway, um, if they don't even have enough money to pay for the teachers, then that's that's a more difficult issue than I normally have had to deal with. Yeah, so yeah. I was going to say that at a certain point, if there's no money, then there's no school. Well, there's still some money, you see. You just have to, anyway, we may be able to save one small program in the midst of this burning wreckage. I hope so. I mean, it's pretty widespread, and I, I, I don't see how, I don't see how we could be making the decision to cut vocational programs like for example the uh, uh this article this 48 hills article mentions that the nursing program is going to lose its accreditation of course some some C, some ccsf suit says it's not but i believe the department chair they know the actual requirements versus our pr person and and that's really unfortunate because um as we know we're facing a major nursing shortage um ccsf has had a renowned nursing program. I mean, they've had a, they've had a solid nursing program for a hundred years with that's got a real um, good reputation. And uh, it cranks out a lot of nurses, nurses, firefighters, um, airplane mechanics, like all these, uh, uh, the skilled trades, like construction, um, engineering, all these programs have been cut. And there's a massive demand for not only the classes, but the students who come out of these classes trained to work in those careers. I mean, they're a jobs pipeline for to fill critical shortage, uh, fill critical employment shortages, both in our in our city and state. Um, and, and it's, it's mind blowing to me that we wouldn't be working harder to preserve those. Well, you're right about that. And that's the kind of thing where you really need a functional institution. You can't solve that by little hacks. Right. And we, we desperately need nurses and firefighters. We desperately need people working in construction. And we've already got the infrastructure there to train people how to do those things. But I guess it's cheaper just to throw that away and pay more administrators. It's hard to understand what's happening. And I know you've got a similar article here, Community Colleges at a Crossroads. Yeah, so this is actually a, an article um, that's talking about not just local or state, but uh, on a federal level, um, the fact that enrollments, enrollments going down, um, mostly because um, what I've been seeing is uh, folks are um, having to, and, and folks that are already enrolled are having to drop out to take care of their kids and to maybe um, scramble to uh, to get a second job or they've lost their job so they can't uh, afford tuition anymore um, or they've had to uh, kind of deal with their life circumstances. I think a lot more folks after the um, eviction moratorium are going to be homeless too. So scrambling, uh, I'm sorry, after the eviction moratorium ends, they're going to be scrambling, um, which now is the time more than ever that we should put be uh, opening up opportunities to folks to like better their situation and uh, get into a good paying job. But uh, here we are, we're at a pay, we're at a place where um, according to this article, uh, the overall figure is roughly 10% fewer students than um, at the beginning of the 2019 school year, which seems, um, which seems pretty uh, accurate, uh, like an accurate reflection of, of what we've been seeing. Um, and it also mentions that, that uh, community colleges have been hardest hit. Um, other like four-year schools and private schools uh, didn't have nearly as much of a uh, uh, nearly as much of a hit in enrollment. Um, in fact, uh, the, it's been pretty static for uh, most four-year institutions, um, private four-year institutions. So uh, it's an issue. And uh, how, you know, one one thing though is that the the um, Biden administration is is saying like, okay, we should really kind of take a look at this. This is this is the time that we should probably be um, seeing how we can uh, get folks back into school and give them give them these low cost or free opportunities so they can uh, either get either get job training um, to to retrain or upskill for a new job or um, get started on a bachelor's degree. So. 
Yeah, and Joe Biden is a community college instructor, I think. So right. I think I think when the pandemic ends, I think we can probably hope a lot more funding will come. So I don't think this is a permanent thing. I think it's going to be a year or two, and then there'll be a revival. Um, I hope so. Uh, you know, but but the problem is too is it, you, there's even a quote from uh, our uh, chancellor of of California Community Colleges in here, um, who says like. Well, we don't know what to do. Should we should we raise Pell grants or enact debt relief for student loans or uh, expand tuition subsidies? And it's like, yes, those are all. There's strong arguments for all three of those. But you know, at least here in California, we've got a major systematic problem. We've got to overhaul uh, the way that we're. It's it's not it's not the fact that we don't have the money to keep school running. It's that there are restrictions on the way that it's spent that cause it to be allocated in stupid and foolish ways. And um, there's no real oversight to how money is being spent, wasted or embezzled. So, I mean, I, I think that's a problem in a lot of government areas in, in, in that we need to really look at, the, look at where these public funds are going and how they're being spent. Um, because really when it comes down to it, uh, the only people that are hurt by this are the students and the taxpayers. Um, oh, some of the part-timers suffer too. Yeah, uh, sure, yes. Teachers definitely are the first to uh, endure abuse. I mean, full-timers too. I think that the plan to uh, strip, um, strip uh, tenure and full-time work away from the uh, full-timers who've gotten pink slips, they're just going to essentially put them in the role that Alan and I are in as part-timers now. So, you know, and, and I don't think, I'm not sure that, that the full-timers who did not get pink slips, I'm not sure that they, a lot of them understand that they're next. Like that's, that's how this is going to go. You know, the goal I think is to make everyone a disposable a disposable part-time resource who you've got to pay minimal to no benefits on and you've got no obligation to keep them on from semester to semester. So you can just abuse all your staff that way. And then at the, by the end of it, the only people that'll have uh, stable employment or contracts are administrators, which is just what they wanted to begin with. Yeah, this is why I've always recommended that anybody, a college teacher should regard this as just a consulting gig and just one of your clients. You can't yeah. think of it as like a serious career where it's the main focus of your life. You got to have other things happening. Right. And which is sad because, you know, it ought to be, it ought to be a situation where you can make it your life's work and really put as put 110% into it and improve and grow as a teacher and um, really put that time in with your students to give them a good, um, to give them the best experience possible. But the system is trending away from that. And uh, it's, pre it's pretty unfortunate because, um, you know, we desperately, we desperately need these community colleges as a, um, as a community resource. Well, in tech, you could argue the other way and SANS requires you to be working full-time in the field if you're gonna teach for them. So their idea is your main focus should be really working in the field and you teach like one class on the side is probably the best model. Sure, but I don't think that that's, I don't think that that's applicable for every field and, oh. and especially not for, um, you know, I think of stuff like, uh, like English. Yeah. We, we need English teachers desperately, but I, I think it's unrealistic to expect that they would have a, a full-time job in the English industry. <laughs> no, no, this, that's just for tech. Yeah. Well, anyway, uh, Irvin's got one about Comcast hiding upload speech. This is an interesting uh, little article. We were talking about uh, speeds earlier, yeah. that it's uh, trying to push it up to 100. Well, if you sign up for Comcast, for example, they don't tell you your upload speed you have to dig pretty deep and bug them a whole lot to get an answer from them. They'll tell you download, but they won't tell you upload unless you ask. I remember when I set up my, uh, my Xfinity thing, I had to call because it was not, it was not clear on their site what, what the real details were. Like for example, what the minimum is. 
they don't really say what the minimum that, that they'll that they will give you. They'll just say up to, but what's the minimum? Zero? Is it dial up? Like what what is the what is the down and up? So it it uh, yeah. Yeah, and of course Comcast has some stupid reason as to why this is not easy for them to say, even though I don't well, believe it. If they can shade the down, they can shade the up. I mean exactly. Yeah. They can say the up, they can say the up. But anyway, it takes forever and a day to find out exactly what what you're getting from them. And I think the point is you don't get much upload unless you pay for a business class plan. Isn't that the idea? Yeah, but then those are expensive. That's the idea. Right. Yeah. That's how they make the money. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And they and they lie. I mean, you can call and out, you can I, I talked to Comcast before I moved to my current spot and they're like, Oh yeah, you can get fiber there. There, you can't get fiber here. That's a lie. <laughs> yep. And then we got Dish. That's good from Caitlin. Yes. So Dish is a um, older uh, TV company. Basically, you would get one of those uh, little, you know, dish satellite dishes that you'd put outside your window, and it would grab TV signals and get to your your set top box. And if you couldn't get cable, you could get you know satellite TV that way. Well. Uh, SpaceX um, has, of course, launched their Starlink program to essentially have internet through a bunch of, and I mean a bunch, <laughs> hundreds of low Earth uh, satellites, um, you know, orbiting the planet every, you know, every minute of every hour. And um, it's using the 12 gigahertz band. And it's been doing this for a while, uh, but apparently uh, Dish uh, is now aging and people aren't, aren't subscribing to their, their thing anymore, but they're a large legacy business. And now they are saying, and this is a little late in the game to do this, but they're saying, oh, well, you know, the SpaceX thing, um, you know, they're using our 12 gigahertz band. We wanted that. You should, you should delay their, um, what's it called? The, um, uh, the, the, e, the ETC, the uh, Eligible Telecommunications Carriers uh, designation by the FCC. But they've already launched 100 satellites, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, I know. This is a little late. <laughs> um, so, uh, and, and it's hard to tell if they, they actually have a point here, uh, apparently. So for, for people that aren't, aren't too aware of, of how bands work, especially with space, uh, so already uh, bands are kind of limited um, in terms of like terrestrial use. Like everyone knows if you want to listen to FM radio, you can only get between, you know, like 98 megahertz to like 100 10 megahertz or something like that. And, um, you know, and we, we slice it up, you know, accordingly. Um, and it gets even dicier when you're dealing with space because the atmosphere becomes opaque at about 15 gigahertz. So after 15 gigahertz, like you can't really broadcast any, any, anything else, um, or at least not into space. Uh, so, um, uh, so, so these frequencies are, are highly contested and they're highly sought after. And DISH now wants to move their business to telecommunications to stay relevant. Um, and in order to do that, they're, they're going to the FCC and saying, hey, wait a minute, we want to use SpaceX's, uh, you know, 12 gigahertz, you know, telecommunications thing that they're using for the internet. And I don't know if they have a, have a case or not. It, it's hard to tell just from the article here. Uh, but I will say that I've seen telecommunications companies use these same tactics to try to stomp out competitors. Like you have the big, uh, big companies like AT and T or Dish or Comcast. You know, they get into the area, they get their FCC and, and government licenses, and then they use those licenses and rules to hit the the new people trying to get in on the game uh, over the head to to keep them down. Um, and th this is a huge reason why Liz does not have fiber at her place. Um, you know, there have been efforts made to, you know, get fiber around and stuff. But of course, AT&T says, no, no, you don't have the permits. Well, let's use your lines, AT&T. And ACC says, no, no, we're not going to do that. Uh, so it does seem like, like this is simply just using their status as an old, older big company to keep um, SpaceX. Not that I have much sympathy for SpaceX. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, from doing their thing and competing. Hmm. Well, I think the only thing SpaceX can do is just pay these guys some money to get them to shut up. I mean, they can't change it now. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what the what the deal is. I don't know if they actually have a like I said, it's hard to tell if they have a case. Um, supposedly, the idea is is that they were supposed to orbit at like one thousand fifty kilometers, but now they're orbiting at like 
1,000 kilometers and that changes the game. I, <laughs> this, I mean, it's ridiculous. If they actually launched 100 satellites and they didn't actually have the band reserved, that would be kind of hilarious and outrageous. It reminds me of that Wag the Dog movie where the guy said, we filmed the movie, we were just going to production and then we found out we didn't have the rights. I'm like, wait. <laughs> Yeah, no, no. I mean, they absolutely have the rights, um, and and Dish does not have any evidence that any of this is going to interfere with their network. I mean, this is all just conjecture. That's what I'm saying. It's it's not clear if they have a case. I mean, maybe. I mean, if you can get evidence or something, but well, this is why you do due diligence. Hopefully, they have no case. I yeah. mean, before you spend what hundred million dollars putting up satellites, you make sure that you can actually use that pen. <laughs> Well, that's true. Um, and the other thing too is is that the whole uh, space link thing that they're doing, Starlink, um, is partially publicly funded because we're supposed to be getting internet to you know rural rural areas and stuff. So there's also you know our money too, and so this is our investment. I, I don't like that it's being controlled by a private company, but you know it is it is our our investment too. And this does not like that they now have new competitors all of a sudden because they want to get into the telecommunications field. It's a public-private partnership. That yeah. was a buzzword a few years ago. Yeah, it's, it's like the the Iron Man movie where the the at the end Tony Stark says, "I just privatized world peace," and everyone clapped. And I and I watched that and thought that would be horrible in real life. <laughs> True, but I can't. I already paid my deposit on uh, Starlink, and I just can't wait to send them more money because I want that dish. Oh yeah, I bet. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That I, I can't. I just on a technical level, what they're doing is actually really cool. I, I initially I was a little miffed because they put up so many satellites that they're actually blocking the view of a lot of telescopes, mm -hmm. uh, and you can actually see these like rows of of, of yeah. uh, satellites going over the horizon and stuff like it's it's just like obnoxious. UFOs. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, no. It, I mean, there there was another company that wanted to put up uh, advertisements in space essentially. And, you know, just by reflecting sunlight back down, you know, they'd put satellites in a orbit, you know, in a configuration to make it look like it says Coca-Cola and you'd have stars that say Coca-Cola, buy Coca-Cola. And of yeah. course I was like, don't do that. And then I saw Starlink and, um, and you know, all the, all the satellites, it, it reminded me of those old Iridium flares from the Iridium satellites. And I was like, oh God, and they're going to just put up hundreds of these things. And like already you can see images from telescopes where these, th where these, um, satellites are just, you know, washing out the image. Uh, but um, it turns out what they're doing is actually really cool. Um, you know, they're, they're going to give a lot of people uh, high-speed internet that they couldn't get otherwise. Um, and so maybe, you know, maybe we don't want these permanently up there, uh, but at least as a stopgap measure, because we don't obviously have the infrastructure, you know, this is, this is really cool. And the dishes are amazing. The, the dishes that they use to um, connect to the satellites in space in low Earth orbit are, are uh, they use like basically a phased array of um, 12 gigahertz antennas, mm -hmm. which, um, okay, so this, is, this used to be military tech. Like you would only find this on like radar dishes and like military stuff. I've never seen this in, in a consumer electronics before. Uh, but the way this works is that uh, if you want to figure out like where a signal is coming from, you can look at the phase difference of, of when the signal like hits the dish, right? Or hits the array. So if, if, if uh, the signal is coming like kind of slanted and it hits the top first and then it hits the bottom later, you'll see a slight difference in the phase and you can tell, oh, it came from this direction. And now you're thinking, okay, well that works in one way. Can it, can it work in the opposite way? Like, can you send out in one direction? The answer is yes. And this is something I keep telling people in electronics, the opposite is always true. And this is my favorite example of this. So if you were to do the same thing and send out uh, waves at different phases, they cancel each other out. And then you create beams like laser beams of, um, of, of radio waves that can go in a single direction and like track these satellites really well. I mean, it's absolutely amazing this technology and they're giving it to people for like, you know, like 500 bucks, but I mean, I've never seen this in, in consumer electronics before. That is cool. So how, how does it look? Cause I've seen ones that look like a chessboard, just a square. Yeah, no, the ones that the um, uh, that that uh, Starlink gives out um, essentially has a built-in elevation azimuth uh, rotator, so it can move around and sort of track things, uh, you know, physically. Uh, but it's also in the in a dish. And normally, when you look, and initially this this really got me like thinking, like, what is going on here? Because normally the way a dish works is it's essentially like a like a telescope, 
right? You have a reflector telescope. You, you have all these things. Uh, you have a big dish that reflects the signal back at a um, LNB or a, like a little antenna that it, then it would pick up, right? And, but there's no, no such thing on the, um, on, on the Starlink dish. It's just a dish. And so I initially saw that. I was like, what is going on here? Um, but essentially what it is, it's just, uh, it's the array itself is the dish. Yeah. It's really high tech. This is really new stuff. Oh, it sounds great. Yep. Anyway, Liz here, tell me all about it. I mean, yeah, it's going to be great. I can't wait. I'm psyched. Yeah. I want to see it when you get it. Yeah. And, and yeah. And once the pandemic is over, like invite me over, I really want to like try to reverse engineer and figure out if we can't get some something very specific with the satellites going on. Like, I really want to see if we okay. can't see like what satellites are, are we are connected to and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. And, and apparently uh, they all run on Linux too. So mm -hmm. that should okay. be a really fun, that should be a fun project. Yeah. All right. Well, I guess that's it for this one. And what is it? Friday, we'll be back on Monday. Yep. Thank you for listening to the podcast, everyone. Okay.